Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. Hi everyone, it's uh, Roxanne Durhodge. Um, today I have the honor of moderating a panel, in, pa- panel on leadership and it's a space that um, I spend a lot of time and I've been fortunate to um, be in the same room with uh, many of these amazing women that I sit with today. Uh, and today we're gonna discuss uh, some of the things that we know about resilience and conflict in leadership and some of the best practices based on the different environments that my um, my colleagues here uh, work in. So I'm gonna introduce them as best as possible um, and we're gonna include their bios, which is phenomenal, which will give you a tip of what they do. So uh, Barb Veda, um, Barb has been in the behavioral management um, business for about uh, over 30 years. Um, Barb has done a lot of research and presented internationally at conferences on best practices around uh, counselor uh, education and uh, leadership. So Barb, welcome uh, to our panel today. Uh, There's uh, Linda Crockett and Linda is, um, she was one of the founders of the full service workplace bullying um, and harassment services in Canada, one of the first. And so um, Linda, thanks so much for being here today. And Linda's gonna share with us kind of her perspective. And she also has a fascinating event coming up uh, that we want to chat a little bit more about. Um, next, I have Trina uh, Reikhoff. And uh, Trina is also um, a resilience uh, specialist. Uh, Trina is based out of uh, Toronto. And she's the owner of TLR uh, Solutions Conflict, Inc. And our international um, presence today is uh, June. Joni Petty, and she's in South Africa, and she is an international resilience specialist and also a keynote speaker. So everyone, uh, welcome, um, and so glad to see your lovely faces today. Thank you, Roxanne. Excited to be here. Awesome that you can all make it. So we're going to just start off around, um, I would say, the tempo of what's happening out there in your different environments with... um, uncertainty and conflict. So I'm just wondering, um, and whoever feels like they, they can add um, their perspective, what is it that you're seeing out there with the speaking events or the trainings that you're doing around um, the the element of conflict in the workplace? Whoever I don't mind jumping in. Um, okay. I've done two multinational events this, this uh, week, actually. One is an automotive industry, and the other is a global beverage company. And I found it very interesting, both at executive level. So these were directors in meetings. And um, this global beverage company, I'll start with them as an example. What are, what are we seeing out there, Roxanne? It's a good question. Is they've bought a local South African com- company. So that's uh, really a uh, catapult to this local South African company, 4,000 people, 1,000 people of the global business in South Africa, and it's taken them to number three in the world. I'm seeing in terms of conflict is the uncertainty and the turbulence of a merger is that people are not storming. So you're seeing groups, you know, the good old Tuckman model that we all used in the 60s, people are coming together, they're forming, they're trying to skip that storming, so they're pushing conflict under the... the um, <laughs> And then they're going into trying to norm and perform too quickly. And we know it's essential that teams, if they're going to be high performing, they need to learn to storm. As Brene Brown says, it's, you know, rumbling with that uncertainty. So that was uh, that uh, merger. And then uh, the automotive company was pretty similar. And they're not going through any change. They're a global player and they are not storming. So this overwhelm, this, you know, with this, you know, too much work, too little time, high stress, 
um, is that people are either going gung ho, so you know daggers out, full charge ahead, my way or the friggin' highway, or they're actually going into denial and they're not knowing how to rumble with uncertainty. So I'm seeing polarized um, approach. So two extremes. So you're not yep. seeing the normative, like you said, storming where people are actually articulating or sharing what they're what they're experiencing. So you either get, I would say, freeze <laughs> where they're freezing and or um, just kind of going into the woodwork and functioning as best as possible based on what the expectations, expectations they think are of them. I wonder if um, anybody else is seeing the same thing or if there's some different perspective. Um, that you can add. I'd like to add to that, Joni. I think you've made a really good point because a lot of people are skipping that piece and they don't even realize they're in storming. So even mm -hmm. educating them about what storming is, that you're in the phase of storming, especially with people returning to work after COVID, there's a lot of storming going on. And the kind of requests I'm getting right now, I mean, I deal with more than conflict, I deal with psychological harassment and psychological violence. So that includes conflict and abrasiveness and all of the all of the, what sits below that. But what I'm seeing is larger organizations reaching out for help. I'm seeing a lot of requests for our training on vicarious trauma, burnout, compassion fatigue, you know, with the how COVID has exemplified and caused so much more mental health concerns for professionals as well as our clients. So I'm seeing a greater demand from larger organizations for this training in addition to prevention, intervention, repair, recovery of workplace bullying, mm -hmm. harassment, and violence. So I'm seeing you know, more complex cases, larger organizations, and looking for mini mental health series as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll add, I think that's very important what you've said, and I'll just add to the conversation that I think what I'm hearing on the ground is sort of from the, the the employees struggling with enormous amounts of change and they're struggling with organizational changes. Many companies I'm hearing from are, are making, uh, bringing teams together, doing large scale integrations. They're working with teams they don't know well. They don't have that, uh, you, the usual, and I think Joni, you said it, they don't have the usual patterns established. We've come out of COVID, we've jumped into like, new projects or new initiatives, new companies, and we don't have the commonality of trust mm -hmm. and we don't have the familiarity of how do we work through change. Yes. I think the place, and I think this is where leadership has a real a, an opportunity, is to really get into the space of change management. We all know a business has to keep running. We all know that they also have to make changes and they have to do two things at once. And if you do not manage the space between both of those and take people along the journey, then they make the journey up themselves. I'm sorry to say that their fear, yeah. their anxiety comes to the surface and all their, so, their, their usual coping strategies typically drop. Their resilience drops, their, their comfort drops, and the conflict is, is bubbling. And it's not bubbling because necessarily they don't, you know, they don't want to work as a team. They've missed, as Linda said, and as Joni said, they've missed that step of, of joining together and forming, let alone, mm. you know, the storming is one thing, but they don't even have that trust. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah that, I'd like to add, I just like, sorry, Trina, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, like, I can resonate with all of your experiences of, you know, being a resiliency conflict, but also I've been doing those workplace assessments that are now mandated under occupational health and safety federally and provincially. And what is interesting is coming through COVID that trauma informed is the key word, but a lot of people don't understand the behavioral reactions and how to identify them. And then you link in, yeah, we need to be resilient. From my perspective and having done resiliency in 25 years, trained from a guru in California, it's looking at that personal, professional, operational, organizational, organizational risk management, right? Take those failures, take those mistakes, take the learning from COVID and actually name them, document them. How did you actually get through COVID? Because that's what we're forgetting. People are not using the resilient risk management skill sets that have developed through COVID, putting a name to it, the environmental context, and then using that to build the leadership. Mm -hmm. And what's yeah. 
gone through our work, you know, the workplace assessments, doing them, they're confidential, but then you do the focus groups and the individual interviews. People just want to feel heard and, mm -hmm. and, and recognized, right? We're coming back to work, but it's really that big push again, status quo. Let's get back to what was before COVID. And what I like to share with them is you got to think of COVID was like a death. We have to grieve it. Mm -hmm. Recognize our world is never going to return to the way it was, but here's an opportunity to create that leadership legacy and not just bounce forward with, you know, that resiliency of belt and forward. It's bouncing past forward. It's using that needle to excel and use that learning and transformational growth. And then what comes with that is as humans, we all assume because you've learned the skill or you sat in that workshop, you know how to apply that skill in the environmental context when it happens, when in reality, the performance deficit is huge. Yep. I think what you said is incredibly important because you brought up the piece of trauma informed. Mm -hmm. You know, before COVID, we had the risk factors of conflict. We had the risk factors of bullying, harassment. Now with COVID, we've multiplied that by what, 10? You know, so the higher risk factors of conflict, higher risk factors of bullying, higher risk factor of mental health issues or psychological injury is just so much higher. So we need the trauma-informed training and that's really missing. As far as leadership, you need trauma-informed training in order to feel competent and in order to feel confident because this is going to be incredible pressure and stress on you as a leader. You have to have that, that toolkit that helps you understand all these individual reactions to COVID. And I agree with you, there's a grieving process here but there's still a learning process because there's new information still coming out about the vaccine, about the effects of the, all of it. And there'll be grieving on many levels for many years to come. That's a very important point, but it's not over yet. So this our old norm, we're grieving. And now we're anticipating this new norm, but it's got to involve that trauma-informed awareness. And it's our opportunity right now. Like this is the only time in life where we know trauma sits on our epigenetics and goes through seven to eight generations. So now's the time where we have to become trauma informed, name those behaviors, those performances, because we are the future. We are the baseline. We are the stability of creating that intergenerational trauma resiliency for the future generations. That's an excellent point. Excellent point, Trina. Sorry, I cut you off there. Carry on. It's just a brilliant point you're making. And not a lot of people are making your point. So let's 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 back up for a second because I think this is all phenomenal information. And for leaders that are listening and they hear the word trauma informed, what is it? Is it is a is it a label that we're using and we don't really know what it represents? Because I want I would love the perspective of what it is and what it is kind of attached to a company because I think that's what happens sometimes. I'm going to apply this trauma informed perspective and then it gets applied and nobody really knows what it's about. So for, and I know you all would add breath and depth, but tell people that are listening that may not know what that means, what it is and really what it's not and what you're seeing out there. That might mean a different thing to different people here because we all come from different backgrounds. So I'm Absolutely. a trauma therapist. And I've, through a trauma lens, I'm going to explain to you that that doesn't mean a leader has to become a psychologist to be trauma informed, but investigators or assess people who are doing workplace assessments, people who are in leadership positions, even HR, in my opinion, it should be mandatory that they have trauma informed training. And what that means is to understand people's reactions, what their physiology and the biology of trauma, the fight, flight, freeze that you mentioned earlier, just the basics of that, that the person in front of you that is angry and irritable and agitated might not be a difficult person, but they might be having a panic attack. They might be suffering from depression. A lot of people don't know that. Even therapists, not all therapists are trauma-informed, and that's a misunderstanding out there, that we're not all trauma-informed. You know, we, we're not all trauma therapists. We might specialize in grief and loss or addictions, but that doesn't mean we're trauma informed. So just having those basic understanding of what a panic attack is, what anxiety is, what depression is, what PTSD, basic training in this area. So you know what to watch for. But you, and then you also know how to respond appropriately. Because an awful lot of leaders and an awful lot of uh, investigators or insurance companies and even medical doctors don't understand the kind of injuries that these things do and, and make comments 
that are more shaming and blaming and more causing more injuries to their patients or clients or employees. Mm-hmm. So that's I'm gonna, to it. Go ahead, Trina. I'm, I was just, just Barbara. I'm going to add in here just because uh, this is a, a place that I've worked quite a lot. And um, and I think understanding the distinction, this is a being trauma informed means education, providing trauma-informed counseling is a specific methodology. It is a unique skill set and it is you have to be trained. Now I will say that often organizations buy mental health services. Most organizations in Canada and around the globe have EAP services. That's a valuable service. That service, the fundamental clinical service they are providing is short-term solution focused. When I began, and I'll tell you it was a long time ago, 30 years ago, solution focus literally was a, helped 80% of the people we, we saw. And I look to you, Roxanne, you were in this with me. 20% of the people we saw needed something different. Now, were we trauma informed? No, we were solution focused therapists with a core competency typically in CBT. Our tool bag was very robust and we may have other clinical methodologies, but we were very much in the here and now, no going backwards, only going forwards, having a very specific goal. Now, fast forward around 2015, CBT methodologies really came to the forefront because there was exponential growth in depression and anxiety. And that is a very helpful set of skills. Again, very goal focused, very behavioralist, lots of awareness, but a practical, easy, bite-sized ways to manage problems. These two methodologies can be helpful down the road, but when someone comes to you and they join with you and they tell you that they've been bullied or there's been a traumatic event or a disruptive event in the workplace or they've been exposed to an accident, I mean, there are many disruptive events in the workplace, moving into the wrong clinical approach can be harmful. So I think this is a complicated message. I think when you as leaders are trying to evaluate the right type of support to to help, you really need to lift up and get quality information and get educated. So I sound a bit preachy, but this is a place of passion because I think the, you know, clinicians, this is my call out to them is, and to me, is get informed about these different methodologies and get certified and get trained. So I'll, um, there I go. (laughs) I'd love to add a concrete example, because when I give my informed workshops, I use the example of having lived in Alberta, I've lived up in Northern Alberta in Coal Lake. So back up there, it's a Navy, or sorry, it's an Air Force base. So Air Force base, once a year, they'd have maple flags. So when maple flag happens, all the top fighter pilots of the world come and practice for five, six weeks. So my everyday thing would be before I drop the kids off, we'd go onto the tarmac. You were like right by the tarmac. We'd watch the jets get ready. You could feel the engines. You could see the flames. It was better than caffeine. I called it rumbling, right? And then we'd watch them take off, land, everything. So whenever I hear jets and I could hear those F-18s, I get... The behavioral, the somatic is I get excited. My heart starts racing. I get a big smile. I'm adrenaline. I am happy. However, now take the context. And my ex-husband is military and I used to be a veteran affairs case manager. So very well versed in that environment and lived on military bases. So imagine a vet who's been medically released and now he's going to go for a job interview. And as he's walking into the building for the job interview, The F-18s are flying by because there's an air show happening in Toronto. But he doesn't get that fun, excited adrenaline rush that I'm getting. He's getting flashbacks of when he might be that pilot who was shooting down in 9-11. And all of a sudden, he's getting those flashbacks, and now he's having a trauma response. But he's supposed to walk into this building and go and have a job interview with HR. And so he walks in, but he's not fully present and they're noticing the behavior's different. Everybody knows there's an air show because they now announce it in the papers, TV, radio. You think about people who've come over from the war, right? The sound of planes is not always a happy feeling for people. It is a trick. 
So if you were in trauma informed and you were aware that the air show was going on and here's a veteran, cause it says he's a veteran on his resume coming in, but something's off becoming trauma informed. You would be able to recognize and understand the environmental context that might be influencing the behavior and how to then ground him. So then he could fully participate in the interview. I like that example, Trina. And another piece to add to that is that that person coming in would get the message from that interviewer that it's safe to share. I'm having a reaction because you might not even be able to say that, right? That I'm having a reaction. You know, people who've just come out of a very uh, toxic work environment going to a new interview, they're having anxiety, they're getting triggered. And having an environment that is trauma informed would set the space, a safe space for an interview and allow you to be honest rather than make up some stories as to why you've left that job. A lot of my clients say, well, how do I, you know, what do I say if they ask me why I've left that job? It should be okay to say I was bullied. There was an investigation. It was substantiated and I need to, I need to move. So that's what trauma informed would be. And I think trauma informed is one strategy in creating a psychologically health and safe workplace because trauma informed provides the workplace, the leaders, that psychological protection that they're giving to their employees and to all their staff members, everybody in the organization. So understanding where trauma informed fits under the Canadian national standards, the international labor standards of the 45003, the Bill, you know, 168 in Ontario, each province has their own descriptors, but understanding trauma-informed and creating psychological health and safety now is a risk mitigation strategy for all of them. That's amazing, right? Because, you know, the average person and all of us here, we understand all the lingo, right? Mm -hmm. And, And I think of when I worked with Barb and I managed a portfolio of 50 companies at any given point, I would say about 65% of my portfolio was in flux. So think of the context Mm -hmm. of not knowing some of the basics that we're talking about and now bring it forward to 2023 where flux is a a macro kind of umbrella to everything that people are experiencing within companies and then try to not be trauma informed about what people experience through COVID, what people are going through with um, right sizing, downsizing, um, you know, selling off of certain parts of companies, um, mergers, acquisitions. That's a whole lot of moving parts all at once. And within the context of that, we're wondering, you know, what are people needing? And if you're not aware as a management team or a supervisor or a middle manager um, of all those elements, not that to to someone's point, you don't have to be um, a trauma therapist or a psychologist in any way, but you have to know the fundamental basics of what are the symptoms potentially that might display itself when someone's sitting across from you and then know enough to say they're needing a bit more. They need to be able to be sent somewhere else. And I think that's the education piece that I think is is, is needed out there. I think though for the education piece, what I find to be absolutely ironic is that we're talking about psychological safety, psychological. (laughs) It's in the title. It's right there. Psychological hazards, psychological harassment, psychological violence, psychological injuries. It's right there. If you've got a psychological component, you need to have the trauma informed piece as well. Absolutely. And I think too, it's the importance of the leaders of everybody. It's being vulnerable because you got to be able to recognize your own trauma response because we've all experienced something. So to be able to start becoming trauma informed by a reflection of your own past history, your own experiences of trauma, whether personal, professional, or environmental, an earthquake, you know, capsizing on the water, environmentally, there's many. So it's becoming trauma-informed is even recognizing what might you might experience so that if you're triggered or you might have a flashback while you're having an interview or giving a meeting and you're not sure why. You know, I think we have to bring this back to leadership, if we can, about being the leader themselves being trauma informed is a part of that is having that emotional intelligence about when you're being triggered as a leader. You know, I might be a leader who's avoiding conflict because I have a past history of being a child of a domestic violence. Right. And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm now avoiding conflict, which means I'm not being a really effective leader 
because I'm avoiding conflict within my staff. So part of being psycho, you know, trauma informed is that emotional intelligence, having self insight to your own triggers, your own limitations, your strengths, of course, but also to having trust in your own judgment, being aware, knowing that you need to go deal with your fear of conflict. All of that's involved. So that emotional empathy piece is involved in trauma informed. And as leaders, um, Linda, I was going to say the same thing, is that 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 emotional intelligence piece. I mean, I uh, look at research from 150 countries. I mean, that's a lot of big bank research, uh, 100,000 people at a time. Is that you know this whole emotional intelligence piece? We know that the research is showing that leaders who have good EQ are perform you know twice as as well as leaders who don't. So if you're trauma-informed, I love the examples that both you um, and Trina have given. So, you know, if you come from, you know, a household when there was abuse um, and there's bullying in the workplace, is how do you actually language that? So your emotional literacy, how do you navigate those emotions? So it's having all of those capabilities, and those are measurable skills. Those are teachable skills. So we are finding worldwide that we're – organizations are prioritizing EQ upskilling and training, they are 22 times more high performing. So it's really, you know, that's the heart of it is, you know, I always look at resilience with four dimensions and we can go, you know, risk management and change management programs, but I go, you know, emotions drive people and people drive performance. So you've got to go back to the person and the person that's four legs to the table. What is their mental resilience like? What's their emotional resilience like? What's their physical resilience like? And what's their sense of purpose? And when you start dealing with people as individuals, giving them those EQ skills, teaching them that self-awareness, giving them, you know, to what uh, Bob was saying earlier, those things around as individuals, how do we trust each other. You know, trust worldwide has gone down dramatically. So we've really got to go back to, I think we've got to go back to basics post-COVID. And leaders need to be given some of these, the, the toolkit to handle, you know, what we used to call the soft skills. So yes. Joni and team, here's my question. And this is, I love what you said. And here's the challenge. If you look at uh, the corporate structure, the executive structure, I believe it's still often dominated by men and there isn't as much diversity as we wish. I think that tide is changing. What we know about, and I'll be the counselor again, I'll put my counselor hat on, I'm a leader as well, but as a counselor, women are more likely to get the training and go for help. Men do, but it's it's not they're not represented as equally. So now you take that into the boardroom. How do you get the executive culture to value these softer skills? This is the scary word of trauma, counseling, psychological, all these words can be very triggering. How do you yep. put them into yeah. a context that they show the value of that social importance for your leadership uh, skills, but also for your organizational performance? As yeah. we become more aware as investors, are holding organizations more and more accountable to the social aspects of their organization, these skills are going to come higher and higher into the priority list. Mm -hmm. So shifting that yeah, traditional male set of skills that we've all experienced as leaders, not to mm -hmm. be sexist here, but I am being a little generic and, and generalizing, how do we shift that into these other types of conversations and soften it's simple. and increase. It's simple. Okay, it's good. Simple. Joni, solve it. Give it to us. <laughs> Trina mentioned it earlier, workplace assessments. So it's like I work mainly at senior management and director level. And you're right, unfortunately, Bob, is that 80% of the teams that I work with are men. So I don't ever, and you, you know, you would say data, I would say data, um, is that workplace assessments, you've got to go in with data. So I did a Chicago team, actually, all men on Tuesday night. And it was interesting. I made them do a workplace assessment. I said, here is a worldwide validated assessment. And it's validated and it's reliable. I teach at business schools. It looks at the five drivers of, of high performance in your exec team. Are your people motivated? Are they um what are they have the ability to um 
and agility to handle change? What is the teamwork cohesion like? What's the execution like? And then the fifth driver is trust. And let me tell you, there, there were three pulse points per each of those five drivers. So 15 pulse points. And that was scoped against uh, 50,000 teams worldwide. So looking at where they were at, they were shocking these men and trust was at a low. So mm -hmm. you can't open those conversations unless you've got data. I think that's yeah. a simple way to crack the code. Can and I just data, ask you a question, you Joni? How do you get them to accept an, uh, an assessment? I mean, I agree assessment and data is critical, but how do you even get in the door if you've got resistance? The old boys club, the old girl club is saying, no, I don't want, you know, I don't want to know. They have all kinds of reasons. How do you get past that? I, I can share that in, in Canada. Coaching. coaching. Huh? When you're coaching the CEO, and I've been coaching the CEO for a year now, and um he has a hybrid team in Chicago, Spain, Amsterdam, and Cape Town. So his exec team are all over, these guys. And I said to him, I can tell you right now, from what I've heard around the world, you don't have a cohesive team. And you, if I was you, you got to, you know, as good old Jim Collins said also 20 years ago, you know, good leaders need to look in the mirror to see what's happening. So let's put the mirror up. Let's have an assessment and let's, you know, see what's but what happening. what do they say? I don't want to know. I mean, that's that's the, unfortunately, then they take something critical. Oftentimes, unless you're in the front door with a CEO for them yep. to start to listen. Or in but Canada. Like, yeah, we take we Canada, to, yeah. We've had critical situations, time. right? Unfortunately, yes. then that opens the door. Or yeah. um, business cases too, right? Like competitive edge, uh, potentially. But Linda, you're right. How yeah. is it, we you know, if you are, if you're, if you're preaching to the aware Right now, I've lost someone. I've lost someone. There's been a critical accident. Um, I'm losing market share. So what's what's the value of a case? That's different. But if you're trying to, if you're talking about the unaware uh, portion of sectors, uh, that's something. I mean, uh, maybe Trina can share. She was going to share something. Yeah. Those are the people that are harder to get to. But maybe maybe you do have an inroads at some point in a different way. With, with the assessments that I do, there is a cost to conflict. So when you want to get to that C-suite or the, the male who's not as sometimes, you know, resistant, it's, it comes down to time, money, and reputation. And there actually is a formula to calculate the cost of conflict. And when you have the metrics and you have the stats of the disability, the retention, the presenteeism, it all comes down. And that's part of having a workplace assessment. This was such a great interview that we decided to turn it into a two-part series. Be sure to tune in next week for part two so you don't miss out on the amazing content. Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxanderhajcom blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.